that on original oncologist went to a new oncologist kind of told him rather than asked i'm gonna do this this is what we're doing will you monitor me and he said yeah I'll, i will like i'm totally on board i think it's reasonable so he was a good oncologist um so three months later went in for my uh, physical kind of exam and in, in my palpable tumors that you could feel the one in my neck was completely shrunk Welcome to the How I Healed It podcast. Here at How I Healed It, we get to hear stories from those who have healed their bodies from the unhealable through alternative methods and the experts who are passionate about whole body health and healing. As I have been on my own healing journey, I have found that the number one thing that has kept me going is learning from others who have gone before me. I believe we can gain nuggets of wisdom from each healing story that we hear. Thanks in advance for subscribing to our podcast so we can continue to bring these amazing stories. I'm your host, Plantfully Megan. Let's dive in. Hey guys, it's Megan and welcome to the How I Healed It podcast. Today I get the honor of interviewing Courtney Campbell. She's a wife and homeschooling mom and a Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer thriver of 15 years. She writes and shares what she has learned throughout her journey online at Anti-Cancer Mom on Instagram where I found her and she is just an absolute inspiration and always giving out nuggets of very usable uh, information to help people along whatever their healing journey is. So Courtney, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Thank I've been you. looking forward to this so much. Um, I would just love to dive right into your story. Would you mind just sharing what your journey was? Sure. So um, when I was 26, it was in 2008, I found a lump in my armpit and um, I, I had always had a little swollen lymph node in my neck that I had had um, examined several years before and the doctors dismissed it. Uh, so I didn't pursue any any um, other information um, until this guy popped up and it was very um, large and it was very quick, it seemed. Um, so I was within two or three days, I was having surgery to biopsy it. And um, yeah, it was uh, uh, then it was during the surgery. I was actually awake um, because they didn't think it was so big and so deep, but it was. I got to see it, which is wow. like nobody ever gets to see when their no. egg size lymph node gets taken out of their body. Um, but uh, and the the surgeon was so uh, like glum, and he said, "You know, I can't say this is good. You know, this is this looks troublesome." Those were his words. And so um, we waited a week and it went to the, like the local hospital pathology at Emory. We were down um, downtown Atl or midtown Atlanta and um, Pied Piedmont rather Piedmont hospital than Emory for anyone who's local. Those are pretty big hospitals here um, with lots of smart people and no one could figure out what it, what they, they knew it was cancer, but no one could figure out what kind of cancer. And um, then it was a, the third week later, which is why that's part of my story. It's why I'm being very specific. It was the third week later, we waited three weeks during all that time. We're going to meetings about, um, you know, um, you know, you need to freeze your eggs and, or an embryo and protect your fertility and all this stuff. And, um, a pet scan, cat scan, um, bone marrow biopsy, like all that was going on. And, and um, the, the third week, um, they finally figured out what it was, but it was sent to UNC Chapel Hill with a lymphoma specialist there um, named Dr. Peter Banks. And um, it, we found out it was like a pretty rare cancer called nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's not the typical classical Hodgkin. So anyone listening to this, that's a Hodgkin's person, typically you're diagnosed with classical. Uh, fortunately, nodular lymphocyte predominant Hodgkin's lymphoma or NLP Hodgkin's is um, a little slower progressing, more like a chronic um, cancer um, that you get it several times throughout your life. You just kind of keep squashing it with chemotherapy. That's how they treat it. And so that's how they told me you need to start with some really good chemotherapy, you know, four rounds, some radiation, and we're going to just like, you know, squash it, but it's going to come back. It's kind of what I've been hearing for the past 15 years. And so I, um, my husband, that last visit, we finally, once we found out what type of cancer it was, what type of lymphoma, or it was a leukemia or lymphoma, it was a lymphoma. And um, we went through a tour of the chemo room. And on that visit, my husband uh, heard the first time in his life this ever happened to him. Not the only time. I'll go about that later. But first time, it, he just had this voice that kind of came in very, very, very 
a prominent, almost audible, he says, and it said, this is not for you. And, um, he's like, he didn't say anything to me at the time, but that was a conversation piece. We don't honestly remember if it was on the way home or at like dinner that night. We don't, we don't remember when we eventually talked about it, but I did not receive it. Well, I was like, well then, you know, cause they had just given us the whole plan. You're going to do this chemo, this radiation, here's where you're going to do it. We were walking through the chemo room. They were literally telling us you're going to sit here. You're going to look at the trees and the, yeah. we have personal TVs for you or whatever. And then this like really, Per, uh, perpendicular thought came into his mind. And of course in my mind too, uh, not in my mind, but in my life, you know, when he told me, I, I just remember being like, well, if we're not going to do what they're saying, like, what are we going to do? I was just so angry. At him. And like, don't, and kind of like, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me this is my body. And he's, I remember one time he says to me, as like newly married, we had been married three months when all this happened. It was so Whoa. new. Yeah. And, um, and uh, he, he, I, he said, your body is my body too. <laughs> when we were talking about the, you know, the fact that the chemo was so toxic that they were asking me to freeze my eggs and embryos, you know, those are really big decisions, you know, um, to make, you know, very big moral decisions. Um, so we, I ended up long, this is a long story short, but, um, you know, we, we did investigate at first, like clinical trials. We called places. We had connections to big hospitals, to MD Anderson. We had a church offering Kevin, where Kevin worked. He worked at a church offering to pay for my housing, my airplane, like they had connections to MD Anderson. And, and we said no to it all, um, to pursue eventually when you research alternatives nowadays, of course it's censored, but back then you could alternatives to cancer, to chemotherapy. And you, you know, and you had all these sites that were offering kind of the weird stuff, the alternative stuff, which we now know is like, can really be effective. But back then we didn't know, we didn't know anybody. Um, so I just told Kevin, um, he was getting all these books in and reading all these kind of like more conspiracy ish, treatments, you know, things that I was just like, that's ridiculous. I'm not doing that. And like my mom, my parents, my family, everyone was like putting pressure. Like, what are you doing? And a lot of anger towards him. <laughs> it was, it was a wild time. People, it's, I was a teacher, people at our school kind of like whispering, like, you know, what are you doing? You need to be careful. Um, and so Eventually I got a book uh, he ordered, but it came to the house and I looked at it and it just like, I knew I was going to read this book because I opened it up and it was looked like the front was kind of big, lots of bold stuff, like, you know, words. And I was like, this book looks really friendly to me. I'm going to read it. I don't know. Something about it spoke to me and um, it was called Cancer Free, Your Guide to Gentle Non-Toxic Healing by Bill Henderson. And I uh, just dug into that book. I, I loved everything he said. He had a ton of survivor stories in there that gave me hope. Um, and I loved, you know, the idea of he had a, he, he talked about, I think, I don't remember if it was in that book or if it's just something I came up with, but, um, I said, I'm going to give this three months, this plan. He gave me a plan to execute. If you give me a plan, I can execute it. You know, I'm just that type of personality. I'm type. the same. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, give me a checklist. I'll check yeah. all the boxes. I will not stop until every box is checked. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's how I operate. Right. Um, and so I started that on November uh, 4th, 2008. It was election day, the day Barack Obama was elected. And I um, started the diet and it consisted of um, certain supplements. I won't go into detail about each one on my blog. There's um, if you click on supplements, at the very top of my blog, there's a, a Reese, maybe it's under resources or it might flat out say supplements, but you can find everything that I talk about on here. You can find it there. Um, so uh, there's a certain regimen of supplements, including beta one, 3d glucan, which was a primary immune supplement I took. And then um, the Budwig mixture, which is the cottage cheese, organic cottage cheese and organic fresh pressed flaxseed oil. Uh, I would order it from Barleen's, which is the largest flaxseed provider, ship it from California, cold, like super fresh. You can do that. You can go to their website and do that. Um, and then I would, you know, you do that mixture also on my blog, if you want the details. Um, and then a plant-based diet other than that. And for me, I was extremely stubborn, picky eater. I had a really hard time with the diet. And so I, for the first few weeks, I could barely stomach. I mean, 
the only vegetables like raw salad I would eat before that was like iceberg lettuce at like the hibachi, you know, like with the sweet sauce, like maybe, but other than that, I would always opt for soup. You know, I was a diet Coke drinker, like Cheez-Its and processed crackers. And that's still honestly, to this day, I don't crave diet Coke anymore, but I crave crackers all the time. It's like, Oh yeah. My, my kryptonite. I just, Oh, I get, I too, the salty. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. So I may still have a problem with that nowadays, but back in my (laughs) cancer days, like I was really strict with my diet and I stayed away from that for sure. I just, I was so motivated. Um, and so I just stuck with, um, that I, I, my first blog's name was green drink diaries because I used to, uh, I used to put my salads in a, in a blender and that's how I figured out I could eat it. I could get all that nutrition down was by blending the salad with water and, um, and that kind of evolved from there. And then it became not just a salad, but I learned about sprouts and I learned about, you know, how to put certain um, spices in my smoothie. And I started creating And every day for lunch. I would drink this 64 ounce Vitamix full smoothie. I learned how, what temperature I liked it at. You know, you just, I learned these things like this is such the short version. It was such a struggle to eat well and to eat the things I needed to, but I had to, cause I had to survive, right? I had to heal do whatever it takes. And so, um, so I drank, I pour, I would drink in the morning before work. Cause I was a teacher. I continued to work through my therapy. I would, um, make my Budwig mixture, which is the cottage cheese flax at all. And then I would make my lunch smoothie and I pour it into two 32 ounce Mason jars. I was going to show my water here, but it's not 32 ounces. So I won't confuse people, but a standard quart size Mason jar, two of those full of green smoothie um, he seal those lids tight, keep it in a cold place. And then I'd eat, drink that for lunch at work. And my students, my elementary school students, which is, they thought that was the coolest thing I could drink all that. And they would want to smell it and they go, ah, you know, <laughs> and, uh, sometimes I'd be like working with them and they'd say, I can smell your breath, Miss Campbell. It smells like grass, you know, <laughs> so funny, but, um, and I drink tons of green tea. I took a green tea supplement. That's another part of the supplements. Um, And I'm just trying to go, I'm kind of going through my day in my head as I'm talking to you is what it looked like back then. And then at night I would eat a cancer fighting salad. Chris Work talks all the time about his cancer fighting. I have one too on my blog, just this giant cancer fighting or huge or big or mega or whatever anti-cancer salad um, and just make it taste good. Add some tasty dressing that you like, add fruit on top. Like I am a fruit in my salad person. I love chopped apples and berries and, um, some nuts, you know, cause you, if you're the person that uh, metabolizes quickly, you're going to lose weight on this diet. And sometimes people need more fats on their salad. Like it's a great place to add that in. Um, I would eat frozen fruit for dessert, you know, just re- keeping it really simple. And for me, I know it's talked a lot about that, you know, fruit doesn't, um, like fruits, fine. But for me at the time, the information was be cautious about too much high glycemic fruit. So I didn't eat like high glycemic fruit, but I did eat berries and I had like green app, chopped green apples. Um, I didn't do a ton of juicing. People asked me about my protocol and I didn't do um, any juicing. I didn't even have a juicer and I hated wasting the vegetables. And <laughs> I, I don't, was so weird. I was so weird, but the, but the pulp, I didn't have a compost pile back then. Like I do now, but I just, like, well, anyway, so that wasn't part of my part of my protocol. Do I juice now? Yes. Occasionally, like here and there, I will make juices and we, it's part of our life now. But when I was fighting my cancer, like you don't necessarily need to juice. Like people don't realize that there are other weather ways, other methods. And um, so I did that. That was, I said, I don't know if I said this already, but I said I was going to do it for three months. I was going to give it a three month try. And I, we, we, um, left that on onco- original oncologist, went to a new oncologist, kind of told him rather than asked, I'm going to do this. This is what we're doing. Will you monitor me? And he said, yeah, I'll, I will. Like t- I'm totally on board. I think it's reasonable. So he was a good oncologist. <laughs> um, so three months later went in for my, uh, physical kind of exam and in, in my palpable tumors that you could feel the one in my neck was completely shrunk. Another thing I did that was important, it's important because it's part of that is SEACT. And um, also you guys can read about all this on my blog, but it's, it's just a, it's a cancer. Um, it was an old cancer protocol from basically where this nurse, this Canadian nurse learned about this tea from um, the Ojibwa Indian tribe. 
um, in the northern United States and southern Canada. And um, and so I started making SEIC tea and I drank three cups a day and that was like part of my detox. And this is especially important for people with lymphoma. Um, when I stopped it, when I went to this detox uh, place here in Atlanta called the Living Foods Institute, I don't think they're there anymore, but I learned a lot about how to chop my food, how to make my food better. I, they taught me a lot about how to live a living foods lifestyle. Um, that was, that was really helpful to me. So if there's somewhere, like if anyone's listening and there's something like that in your area, like go learn how to make your food taste good and how to, how to be excited about it. Cause it's hard to stick to this. If you are just, you know, trucking, you know, just pushing through and you don't really have a love for, it. I, I developed a love for healthy eating. You know, I think a lot of it stemmed from there and like learning how to appreciate every, what every fruit and vegetable was doing for me. It's like, they're like my friends. <laughs> yeah. They're like, you know, good friends. That were healing <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, that's the most hippie thing I think I've ever said. But I love it. One thing I wanted to mention to you guys who are listening is I'm about to start offering extended interviews and other exclusive content to our How I Healed It community. So make sure to head over to howihealedit.com. That's howihealedit.com and sign up for our email list so you don't miss out on everything going on over here at How I Healed It. Happy healing out there, you guys. Now let's jump back into this awesome interview. Yeah. So the SEFT I stopped at when I went to that place and I stopped the Budwig mixture too, because they, they basically said, while you're coming here, we want you just on the raw foods. And I don't think they meant like what I was already eating. That was pretty healthy already. But as far as like cottage cheese is a dairy and, you know, flaxseed oil is a processed oil technically. So, you know, they, they did ask us to like go off everything. Well, for me, that was not good. My tumor increased in size. It, it came back. I could feel it again. And, um, I just, you know, I was like, this is not good. So after I was done with that place, I went back on my butt wig mixture. I just went back to what I was doing, applying my new knowledge and appreciation for food but also going back on what was working. <laughs> so I was only there for 12 days. So it shows you how, like, once I went off my diet, how quickly things sort of like reverted, you know, back to, oh, I can feel it again. And, um, and the SEACT went right back on it again. And I never, from that point on, I, I kept going for another month. At the end of, I started in November, at the end of February, I didn't get my period. <laughs> and I, I was, um, I kind of like had missed it because I had lost so much weight so quickly at the beginning of my protocol. I kind of like every, it was a little weird a couple months even earlier. So I thought, oh, it's just being weird again, you know, but it just never showed up. And so, <laughs> um, I never taken a pregnancy test in my life and I took it and, um, it was positive. <laughs> and so I felt this like a range of emotions of like, my gosh, I'm so irresponsible. I was embarrassed. Like, how am I going to tell people this? Um, how long was, was this after your diagnosis? So I was diagnosed in sep late September, early October, and it took like a little while to finally make the decision of what we were going to do. I told you it was th three weeks until they even found out what kind of cancer I had. And then it was like another week of like, uh, you know, are we even going to, are we going to go with what they said? And then it was it was at the end of that week that I was like, I'm going to just do this, this book and let's get started. And so we did. Um, and, uh, so that was November, December, January, February. So like three or four months to the point where, right. I'm doing math here. I haven't done this now. Three months, three months, um, to the point where I found out that I was pregnant. So. <laughs> wow. Um, That's really fast after. Yeah. So and it wasn't. Like no, Six yeah, it was after you got married or something. Yeah, yeah, and that was not in the plan. I mean, we were gonna go to Europe. We were gonna get a dog. We were gonna buy a house. Like, we didn't do any of that. We just <laughs> got married, got cancer, got pregnant. Like, totally. <laughs> God had a different plan. <laughs> yeah, He sure did, and it's really worked out, and I'm grateful yeah. for it. But, um, like, He really, He really does know better. Yeah. It's hard to accept that at the time, but He does. Especially um, but, when you're going through something hard. Yeah, I think that there's a grappling that begins to happen if you're if you're a person of faith and you have a relationship with God and you believe God is good and then something hard happens. You have to walk that out. Yes, it's not instant for sure. Like yeah. you just got to walk it. You're right. You got to one one day, one step at a time. Yeah. Um, and just ex ex with expectancy, right? Yeah. You know, 
uh, patience, but expectancy too. Yeah. Um, and I will say one thing that we always did is we prayed through every decision and God really dropped, we, we call them breadcrumbs where he just dropped breadcrumbs and we just, it's like, you don't know you're walking in a completely dark room and all he's lighting up is one step at a time and you just take it. And that's what it was like. Um, but yeah, so finding out I was pregnant was actually like, it's all I ever wanted. It was, I wanted to be a mom. And so, um, I was like, well, here we go. I guess this is going to happen. And we, and it just motivated me even more, but it wasn't, but two, two weeks later, maybe around six weeks pregnant, I, I got, I just started getting so sick and I, and I have had extremely difficult, like difficult morning sickness through, through pregnancy. And it did not, did not hold up that time either. Um, it took me a few weeks of eating like crackers and almond butter and some apples. Like I could all I could stomach for a little while. Um, and, but eventually I started being able to tolerate one thing and then another thing. And then eventually by the second trimester, I could do all my stuff again, all my, and my, my lymph nodes never increased in size. I never had, and I, when you're pregnant, you can't drink SEAC tea. So that was one thing I had to stop, but everything else I continued supplements and food. And, um, yeah, I uh, found out we were having a girl on our six month anniversary. Actually, sorry, let's rewind about two months before that. May 4th, which was six months to the day of when I started my holistic protocol. Um, the the uh, doctor said, you know, I'm just going to say, like, I'm going to just document you're in clinical remission. Like, there is no signs of cancer. So that's when I consider my remission day is May 4th. It took six months to the point. And I mean, that's a pretty bold statement when they, they couldn't scan me. They couldn't, you know, so I had to wait for more clarification, which I honestly, at the point of when I was, once I had my daughter in November of that year, um, I, I was like, afterwards, I just didn't even care to get a scan because I had all these palpable areas that I couldn't feel anymore. And I felt amazing. I was like, well, why can't we just, I don't, I, my body's basically fine. <laughs> it seems cancer free. Um, you think with lymphomas, typically, you know, you'll have some sort of symptom that will, you know, pop up again in the same areas, typically here in the clavicle or up here in your, um, in your, in your jawline. So I just decided not to do a scan after, you know, after I had my daughter and just kind of moved forward with life, stayed on my diet for, pretty much a hundred percent for five years. <laughs> wow. Good job. Um, I will and say some days, you know, some days give or take, I was, you know, I would say maybe 95%, not a hundred percent, but that's really good though. Not really good. It, so was it, it sounds like it was primarily a raw foods diet aside from the cottage cheese mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's so awesome. And one mm -hmm. thing that always stands out to me about your story is how you're like, I hated vegetables, but you, Ooh. you did the thing you, you just, you <sighs> choked it down and you, yeah. and then learned to love it. You developed the love for it on the journey, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, on the, I, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, go back. Yeah. Five, I want to say this. It's not like at five years, like I went off and like, I'm eating garbage again. It was yeah. maybe like down to like 80% and I was right. started kind of incorporating meat more like healthy meats. And mm -hmm. uh, I have a cheeseburger, you know, we, we, all, we go to the grass fed burger place and I would have a cheeseburger and fries every now and then, or have pizza with my family. And I wouldn't like say no cheese. I would eat the cheese and the, and I get, but I would get it loaded with vegetables. So I think, I think at one point I started focusing on like making sure I was getting the healthy foods rather than like cut out all the bad, you know, the bad foods. Um, and I still to this day have like food issues and I, I, it's difficult for me, usually not while I'm doing it or while I'm eating it, like a recreational food. I like that phrase. Um, it's afterwards or I kind of like will struggle with beating like the beating of myself, <laughs> like beating myself up about it. Um, and I don't, I don't know the solution to that. You just kind of push through it and do your best to live, I guess, where you're, you feel like you're satisfactory yeah. in what you're eating. Yeah, totally. You know, I think that's really beautiful and it's really real because when you've gone through a health journey and then you shift like a completely different direction in the way that you're eating and you find it to be life-giving, like it literally saved your life the way that you went about things completely mm -hmm. naturally. And 
then knowing it saved your life, I think it would be, it feels like it would be a very natural response that if you have a recreational item, like a piece of pizza or something, and it's so good that you would feel that emotions because you're like, oh, you go back and forth about it. But I also think there's something to be said about how important it is to, especially once you're in remission, you know you're in remission, to like enjoy your life and it's not to stress about those things. Yeah. And so finding that balance is a dance that you have to embark upon. <laughs> yeah, the other little voice, it's like there's my self-criticism and then there's my perceived other people. <laughs> like especially when I, I mentioned um, my blog used to be called Green Drink Diaries, like maybe six years ago, seven years ago, I changed the name over to like a really great brand, Anti-Cancer Mom. So I'm like, you know, I love that. I love being anti-cancer mom, but I'm not perfect. And so I'm just kind of like breaking free of I'm anti-cancer mom and I'm perfect because people call me that. I never thought people would actually call me that, but uh, which is funny. Like people will say, she's the anti-cancer mom. <laughs> I'm not. I, I mean, yes, yes. That's, yeah. It's just funny. Um, but yeah. And I, and I, and I love that because I feel like it's, it's going to help so many people, but uh, it's like, I can't sustain this level a perfection through the honestly i've been eating lately more i noticed for stress because i um this is like the spoil alert but i have six kids now <laughs> if anybody doesn't know that and that can have stressful times it can have times where it's not it's not like i'm going oh my kids are so stressful i'm eating out of stress blah, 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 blah. it's like i have so many other things i have to check off my checklist every day or you know just tasks to keep my family healthy and happy then I don't have time to just, you know, obsess over my diet anymore. That used to be like a hobby for me was obsessing over my diet. And I, and at times I like really loved it. I loved, you know, but I'm just like, I'm not in love with that right now. <laughs> I'm in love with my family, my children, homeschooling my kids. And um, so, yeah, sometimes I do eat convenience and sometimes I'm like, this is, this is good for now. And I, just I think that's beautiful. And I think, I, I would argue that it it the making it clear that you're an authentic human makes you so much more relatable. And I think that's a benefit and a blessing because I mean there I mean literally you're you're not in the same crisis mode as you were oh, I'm not. fifteen years ago. And well, I tell myself I'm in crisis. I'm in crisis mode if I don't I mean I did live like that for a long time. If I don't do this, my cancer's gonna come back. I had very severe postpartum depression after my third that it was aggravated into years of struggling with anxiety and depression because I was so afraid of my cancer coming back. And, and it was, it was, um, you know, this has been a long, this has been 15 years, you know, so there's little pockets and seasons of my life where I, um, struggled with other things besides cancer. And one of them was that like struggling with just worrying about my health and being overwhelmed and not knowing how to ask for help, you know, not even knowing why I was feeling like I was, you know, the time. And some of that was also having like, like I mentioned, like, you know, keeping up with an online presence, like you got to, you know, uh, you got to decide when maybe it's a season for a break from that, you know, and time to focus on what's in front of you. We live in a very digital world and people have like a digital persona and then there's like the real person in the real life. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's so good. What were some of the, the things that you learned in your postpartum to support you through that? journey. Yeah, that was, that's like a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think done. I can give you a couple of, of like key pointers. Um, number one is just to make, like, if you're a mother dealing with this stuff or just somebody that's overwhelmed with a, any part of your life, you're devoting a lot of your life to like, you've got to take a break and give yourself, even for me, even a 10 minute break alone, doing something I love is great. Um, and very restorative, but as you know, for me, I know this doesn't sound very enlightening, but no, it is. Um, just take a break. It's so simple. Um, beyond like the, the, you know, some people with anxiety or depression or um, mood stuff, 
Um, I like calling it mood stuff because it kind of diffuses the seriousness of anxiety and depression, but you just got some mood stuff. Uh, one of my counselors gave me the saying, she's like, you're just more anxious than the average bear. <laughs> you're more, you know, um, we're very hard on ourselves. Uh, a point um, I, I loved talking to this part of my brain that we call her clipboard Carol. She is just the cl the checklist person, part of my personality, right? Can be very like, oh, you shouldn't have said that. Oh, you know, that you're so stupid or that's so dumb or what are they going to think of you? Or um, you should, it's like the person that's shooting all over me, you know, should, shooting, you know, um, it's, you know, telling me that should or shouldn't do something. It's like, no, you just have to talk back to them. Like, whoa, chill out, sister. That's kind of in my, my thoughts. That's how I'm talking to Clipboard Carol. Um, yeah, that's that's a healthy thing. Um, in the instant of someone who's feeling really panicky and you're, you just are like borderline on a panic attack, these are some, you know, maybe going off topic, but but this is like a real people really struggle with feeling like they were going to have a heart attack because they are just so their chest is so tight and um, they're breathing heavily and their heart's beating fast. Even though sometimes it's not, you just feel like it is. I just, she, my one of my counselors, she's amazing. Her name's Brenda Stockdale. She has a great book too, if you want to look her up. Um, that's a crazy God story, the how I met her. Like he dropped the breadcrumb hardcore on that one. But she was so helpful to me. And she just would say, if you're alone and you want to calm your nervous system down and keep you from having a panic attack, you can just, this is called, just go like this, like, because you cross your vagal nerve. And I'm not an expert. I'm repeating what she told to me. Like it basically helps tone it and like it helps your, um, your parasympathetic nervous system like become stronger. Um, so this also just this with your other hand on your belly. And then if you are in public and you're in like a restaurant and you feel like you're going to have a panic attack, these are real things that I would feel, or even just talking to my husband sometimes about something and we're a little confrontational and not agreeing. I will, I will feel kind of like revved up and I will take my finger like this and you just take it and from, and you just hold, hold it. Like, mm, <laughs> I don't know why that awesome. works. Can you guys see it? Yeah. You just go like, like baby shark or whatever. <laughs> yeah. For those who are listening, head over to YouTube and you can see all of yeah. the emotions. So pinch your two, your hands. thumb and your index together. And then like from the, from like with your, with, with your palm facing towards you, you just hold that area and just, you can put it on your lap. You can, you don't even have to, you could do it either way, this way or that way. But for whatever reason, sorry, my take my kid to gymnastics alarm is going off. Um, you can, yeah, that helps it. Like really, it relieves me from having a panic attack all the time. I do not know what it is if you're just focused on like whatever you're doing. And then of course you probably know this one, but like the breathe through one nostril and then change to the other. Those are all really helpful. So anytime there's a reason that when people are shocked or um, it's a natural reflex to put your hand on your chest. So like it, it is very calming. And then of course here. So all of this is very calming. Anything that's kind of like giving you a hug. I love uh, that. Even just doing that with you, I could feel that yeah, shift feel in my it. body. It's so yeah. simple. I yeah. might have to put the Instagram reel on this one because yeah, this is you really should. easy to teach and just uh, really basic. So uh, yeah, there's probably a million other things. There's supplements and there's like essential oils and there's going outside is like the number one most nervous system, cal system calming thing you can do. Um, yeah, a lot of this stuff, like I said, just stemmed from postpartum and I called it postpartum depletion. I just felt really depleted and I was not giving myself the rest that I really truly needed. I was trying to do way too much um, afterwards and we don't have a we don't have a support system here and especially well we do now but really you know we're pretty much on our own we're a very like self-sufficient family but that's nothing to boast about people who have support um whether it's parents or in-laws or sisters or brothers or whomever um yeah like that's always i think they're much less prone to postpartum issues if you have support and then just yeah, right. Rather, I would say any mom that's postpartum or moms in general, if you're trying to like just get right back to exercising, like go on a walk outside with your baby. That's the best exercise you can get and stop trying to be in such a rush, you know? Um, yeah, it's just, those are some wisdom from the mistakes I've made <laughs> and what I think the more children I've had that I've corrected. 
also random. Oh, wait, do you want to cover random after birth? This is like a game changer for me. Save your placenta, have somebody encapsulate it and take it because I had postpartum depression with my first four. Somebody suggested with my son, I had a number five was a son, a boy, um, that I do that. And I did, I had zero postpartum depression and zero anxiety and it's crazy. And I thought, well, maybe it's just because my first four were girls. So my number six was another girl. And that was like my big test for my, my scientific experiment. Like, keep the variable the same, but change one thing. And I did the same thing with her, had someone encapsulate my placenta and I followed their protocol of what they say, take these, um, this amount every day or whatever in the morning of the pills, of the placenta pills. And um, I had zero postpartum depression with her too. So my hormones, my hormones were just so regulated. I don't, I don't not know. And for, I've heard stories of people saying, oh no, it, I, it made me crazy or whatever. But for me, I'm like, I can't get any crazier than I already was. So yeah. I'll give oh. it a try. <laughs> I love that. I've heard, I had a friend who had that experience as well. Her first one, she had debilitating postpartum depression and then did the placenta thing that she was kind of against the first go around and it changed everything for her. Mm -hmm. So I think that is really hormone regulating, which is really mm -hmm. beautiful. Okay. So one question I wanted to ask you was about SEAC T. Did you use, I know there's, a, I've seen a few different formulations for SEAC. Did you use the traditional five ingredients that are in the original SEAC tea, or did you use the one that has been expounded upon, which has, I think, seven ingredients? Yeah. So I thought for the longest time I, I used the traditional recipe, but apparently it was the eight herb recipe. Okay. Um, yeah. So it I, when I was going through cancer, I used fluorescence brand in the tonic bottle, like okay. 32 ounce bottle. Um, but when like later on when I started making it myself, I would get the Ojiba brand, which was the original four, I think four or five. I thought it was four, but you might be right. It might be five um, herbs in there. And um, so I've made both. <laughs> so you've done but, both. Okay. Yeah. And I yeah. still do SEAC in between pregnancies and nursing. Like right now I'm nursing, so I can't, I mean, you, right. you can, like when I get sometimes pregnant women often, like every month, at least I get a pregnant woman who has cancer and she asks me about the SEAC tea. And I say, you know, if it were my choice between having to go through chemo while yes. I'm pregnant and drinking SEAC tea while I'm pregnant, no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. So, cause there hasn't been, you know, just like all the natural supplements. I'm so sorry. My daughter is up from her nap and you can hear her if you hear squealing. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's not like it's, it doesn't, these herbs don't cause miscarriage. It's just because of the detoxification effects of the tea. But, you know, I've never felt an actual physical detoxification sensation when I drink SEAC tea. So it's like, it's a very gentle cleanse. So, you know, people need to pray about it and make their own choice about that. So I've heard so many amazing stories with SEAC tea. My husband and I actually drink it as well. I'm like, might as well taste. We've figured out a way to make it taste really good. We'll put some uh, pumpkin spice, just pumpkin spice, like the cinnamon cool. and nutmeg in there. And then a little bit of uh, nut milk. And it makes it kind of like a tastes like a chai latte, like a black yeah. chai latte. It's I so, never so thought yummy. about that. Yeah. I am so nostalgic towards it. And so for whatever reason, when I drank it, even 15 years ago, I told you I was the pickiest eater that I can think of, um, that I know even to this day, I'm still, I still have it with certain things where I'm like, eh, no, I'm not going to eat that tomato. I don't really want a tomato on my salad or wh whatever. It's like, it's a tomato. I have kids though that eat tomatoes like apples, you know, it's crazy. Oh, one of them's running the Vitamix. Sorry. <laughs> you can okay. hear that. Yeah. They all make, they, two of them make their smoothies now. Um, it's crazy. Like that's that's, awesome. they eat so differently than me, that's uh, so than awesome. I did, than I did growing up. But right. Right. Um, yeah. So for anyone that's listening about the SEAC tea, it doesn't taste, it tastes pretty good. Even just plain uh, for whatever reason, I like to drink it plain still. I do. I like it plain as well. It's just, it's fun to get creative and 
I think one of the blends I got was kind of like it had this stinky taste to it. I think there's just one more additional herb in there. And mm. that's when I came up with the pumpkin. I was like, well, let's make this a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. A bit more palatable. I hear you. With, yeah. I, and I love that your husband like makes, like does these things with you. I mean, my husband does to a degree. I don't think he'll get to the end of this podcast and hear this, but I'll, I'll tell him tonight that I've said this. Um, but he's just, you know, he's definitely go, he goes in like waves of enthusiasm about the way that I, that I like to eat. <laughs> That's all I'll say. I think That's with anybody. Yeah. Well, God gives us what we need to go through these things. And for you, you've had the discipline to stick in it and do all the things and, for me, I'll go, th- I'll go through these moments of discouragement and I'm really grateful for Chris because he will be the one champion. He will be the one being like, nope, keep to it, stay consistent. And I couldn't do that without him, him doing that. Or he'll make me my green juice on days. If I'm not feeling well, he'll make the green juice for me, which I'm super grateful. So I think there's always provision and it's really important to have support. I mean, he's obviously supportive. He was the one who came up with this idea to go an alternative path anyhow. So the having that support, that emotional support, knowing that they're for you in it is everything, even if they're not sticking to it all the time, you know? So do you ever think about like, I have always noticed that healing has taken place when there's this feeling of flow that emotionally I'm flowing. It's like things are flowing and not sticking on me like food wise, even like digestion, right. Or like the stressors in my life, when things are flowing, I feel like that's when healing takes place. Uh, um, with your digestion, when your digestion is just flowing, you're going to the bathroom every, every single day at the same time, you have these rhythms to your life and it creates this feeling of flow where you just, there's no tension and resistance. It's just, you get to this place of flow. And I think that's about when I notice with my cancer that like healing was really um, like ramping up and speeding up and in happening. Um, and so I think like real quick, while we have just a little bit of time left, the emotional part of all of this is almost more important. Chris work talks a ton about forgiveness, but I also want to throw in there um, just like f- learning, finding your voice, learning how to be assertive with people in your life. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to think with your time. Um, and then of course, yes, forgiving the people, um, that have hurt you, but it's all about like kind of realizing yourself and who, who, where you're like, <laughs> uh, vibrating the highest, you know, you, you hear about vibrations all the time where you're just feeling like, wow, my life feels so much better right now. And I think a lot of the changes when you're healing holistically bring that where you feel like I'm so grateful and you become grateful for your diagnosis and it's so weird, but you do. And I think that's kind of the point where you reach where you're like, okay, like I'm at peace with this and I'm, you know, I'm grateful. <laughs> that's great. I don't think there's one person that I've talked to so far in all the interviews that I've done who doesn't mention the emotional aspect of that. And I love how you shared that, the flow. And Dr. Dale Figtree did a, a interview with her and she talked about letting go of even what you needed the outcome to be. She just even let that go of just like, it's almost the surrender to the journey and the peace and the flow of the process. And to be able to settle into that is not easy, especially for us checklist people, where it's like, I just want to know that I'm doing all the right things, click, 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 and it's never enough. Like if, if you have that mentality, there is a training of the mind and emotion and heart where you kind of have to backpedal that and just let the journey be what it is and know that all the resources that you need will come when they come and you're not lacking in anything. It's all coming at the right time. The breadcrumbs will be there and you're healing. You will heal. You will heal. You will find healing. So I think that's so beautiful. I love it. Okay. Right before we end, I would love uh, two things I want you to share where people can find you. And then also if you have one kind of out there health thing that you just believe that could even be controversial, that um, is just a fun, fun thing to share. Well, just one. Um, 
So I think, okay, so you can find me at Anti-Cancer Mom Everything, YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram, TikTok, but I don't do anything on TikTok. I've never done it. I think I have one video up there and I said, I'm not doing this. This is, ugh. Um, uh, and then my blog, anticancermom.com. Um, one thing that's out there, I can, I can, I mean, come on. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's out there. Lots of things. Like there's lots of outdoor, like, oh, I'm going to think of like a hundred things after I hang up. I always uh -huh. do after a podcast. I'm like, oh, I should have said that. But one thing that's recent that's actually helpful and it's a little out there. Well, I think that whenever you feel sickness coming on, spend 10 minutes, take a capsule full of hydrogen peroxide and stick it in your ear and let it bubble and tickle and you're going to want to tug it, but don't move for 10 minutes and then flip over make sure you have a, a washcloth or something just to flip over on and then do the other side. And I swear it stops sickness in its tracks. In all these years of doing that, like I rarely get sick. Um, I didn't get sick the whole last pregnancy. But anyway, I was like kind of wondering, well, maybe it's placebo. Well, we had the flu in December and it was horrible. If you followed me on Instagram, I posted a little bit. Most of the time I was just out of commission. It was so, it just went through all of us for like five weeks. And I was the one that I struggled to get better. I was just so fatigued even after the flu. And I was like, what going, what's going on? And my doctor friends were saying like, oh, it's probably because you're nursing. You're still not sleeping through the night or whatever. And I was like, I just feel worse. Like I've ever felt. And I, God gave me a sign. I had this tickle in my ears. My ears were tickling so bad and I would get ear aches sometimes. And so I started putting the hydrogen peroxide in my ears. The first night I did it, same like I told you, 10 minutes each side. Woke up the next morning, the first morning I didn't feel fatigued. I, it was like a miracle. I went the whole day. I did not feel fatigued anymore. And my draining and my post nasal drip was all getting better. So I did it again the next night, 10 minutes each side. Same thing, even better the next day. I did it again, third day, like completely better. And I haven't been bad since. So I just think there's something to it. <laughs> I love that. And my sister in love, Amanda, has taught me to do that. And so shout out to her because she swears by it as well. So that is awesome. I need to implement that more. It's not comfortable, but I'm going to do that from now on. Oh, I, I, <laughs> Thank I, you so I much. It, I find I like that tickle. I don't know. Oh, I'm yeah. Weird. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it was so great having you on and thanks so much to those who are listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more healing stories and expert interviews, please be sure to follow along and subscribe to our channel. See you next time.